solve the energy problem. Very, very bad media strategy, okay? Because after they were through their first lot of palladium metal, they tried to do it with a different lot of palladium metal, and they saw no results. Other researchers around the world tried to repeat Pons and Fleischmann's work. I heard that something like 60% of the sponsored research from the NSF, uh, the, the, the project managers had requests to divert from the grant objectives to check this out, and it was generally awarded. So there was just a huge excitement to see if this was reproducible, and it was not. Okay? And that created an extremely negative reaction by the physics community, especially in the United States, but I'd say all over the world, but especially a very negative uh, reaction by the physics community. I would argue that it's understandable that there would be this angst by the physics community, especially after the University of uh, Utah had made such a strong early case for this in their, their media strategy. But nonetheless, the point is that this negative reaction, I think, was worse than the initial concern of the media approach. What happened here is this very negative reaction resulted in what I consider to be a, loss, uh, a lack of objectivity. Um, when I went on the 60 Minutes piece, I was contacted by a highly prominent professor from an Ivy League university uh, who just really, uh, <laughs> really was angry with me for having done the piece. And the point was, I laid out the scientific case, but he flatly wouldn't consider it. And when I said, come on, why don't you just work with me here through the data, he said essentially, well, you know, us high caliber physicists, you know, have done that before, and there's never been anything there. So you charlatans just can go on and do whatever you'd like. Okay, well, it's interesting. My scientific reputation, I guess, at least to him, had been stronger before I did the piece. But now, the point is, real science, possibly with outstanding engineering consequences, suddenly becomes a pariah science, a science where no one can go. Since that time, there have been hundreds of excess heat results from at least 20 independent laboratories that basically repeat the Pons and Fleischmann results. They don't all use the same apparatus, and I think that's important. They use about five different types of apparatus, and those pieces of apparatus all have different systematics. Nonetheless, they're showing excess heat. And that's interesting because with that scenario, um, the 60 Minutes story decided to engage. And I should just mention that my opinion of the uh, negative media strategy, in fact, every opinion I express here today is strictly my own opinion, and it doesn't reflect the opinion of the institutions to which I belong, nor does it represent the opinion of uh, any professional societies. But the 60 Minute story, which aired on 4 1909, um, was reporting on a visit I made in October 2008 to Omar Israel. And in Omar, they had observed excess heat while I was there at a fairly low level. Um, there were three different cell designs. And all these cell designs, again, were very different at their location. And all have reported excess heat. Again, different systematics. The five cells that reported excess heat well before I was there, there were, in fact, uh, a number that recorded, that recorded excess heat, according to them, I certainly, this was since 2004, five cells have reported excess heat exceeding one megajoule from a 0 0.3 gram, or about a hundredth of an ounce, palladium foil electrode. Now, the chemical heat release would have produced about a hundred joule, maybe a few hundred joule of heat release if this were a stored, delayed chemical process. And I've had a lot of discussions with scientists here and, and elsewhere about that possibility. But the point is, the observed heat release in the extreme cases was on the order of a megajoule. I'd say much more typically, heat release from these cells that they see heat release, say, once a week or so, is on the order of maybe 50 kilojoules to 100 kilojoules. These megajoule or higher releases have only occurred five times since they've been doing this, I think, since uh, 2003 or 2004. I'm not sure exactly when they started. There's another aspect, which is the heat out divided by the electrical energy in that goes into these systems. And that's equal to, in the case of their best result at four megajoules, 25. So you're getting 25 times as much energy out as you put in. You're getting lower quality heat energy out, and you've put in high energy electrical energy. Uh, 15, 8, and less are more typical. Now, quite similar results have been seen from many other labs, many other labs around the world, Italy, Edna, their national energy lab, Russia, China, Germany, and the United States, primarily Stanford Research uh, Institute, or SRI, and not affiliated with the university, but SRI, to my knowledge, I'm not sure, and the U.S. Navy. 
And uh, recently, particle tracks have been observed by the Navy Spay War Unit in San Diego and reported at the March American Chemical Society meeting this year. And I understand there's work underway by the Naval Research Lab as well. Now let me describe, you load by one mean or an, means or another this heavy hydrogen into the palladium. You have to load to where you almost have one palladium uh, atom per one deuteron, or heavy hydrogen atom. That sort of high loading is critical in order to see this effect at all. If it's below a loading factor of about 85 percent deuterium compared to the palladium concentration, then you do not see excess heat effects. And I think that's relevant. But again, I don't want to go into the ideas and technology and, and science today as much to continue on this course. But the point is that once this is loaded, it can take anywhere from a few tens of hours to a few hundreds of hours, it could be weeks later, before this excess heat effect starts to express. And that is very unusual. Also, I should mention that the conventional Pons and Fleshman experiment showed excess heat about one time in seven for that apparatus type that they used. They had other apparatus that showed excess heat more like 70% uh, uh, of the time. But again, it hasn't been 100%. Navy Spay War tells me that their co-deposition technique of loading the palladium with deuterium shows excess heat 100% of the time. But they don't really carefully measure the excess heat in that experiment. They're looking for nuclear particle tracks. Well, so what's going on? We don't know. And it'll take a lot of well-controlled experiments to figure this out. There is no way to jump ahead. There is no way to take a random guess that's right. Scientific method is a wonderful thing. In my opinion, it's time to stop growling at each other from separate sides of this issue and employ the scientific method to figure out what's going on. The excess heat appears to be real to me now. I, first time I would ever say that, after having looked at the experiment very closely. For 20 years, I thought it was debunked. I thought it was junk science. Now, it seems, it appears to be real to me for reasons that I can defend objectively. Now, my first hypothesis, now remember, I don't believe everything I think, so please, don't you either. But my first hypothesis is, maybe back to 1957, there's a muon-catalyzed fusion of these deuterons that's near, but it's impossible that it would be directly in the palladium. The question is whether close proximity to the palladium would give rise to a larger, longer, sustained nuclear reaction than would be seen in free space. Possibly, again, hypothetically. Now, it's interesting because in this scenario, the, um, the muon-catalyzed fusion, again, has been one thing that was studied at the end of the 1950s 